In Mark 9, why weren't the disciples able to heal the demon-possessed boy? Why did they still need Jesus' intervention? The answer for that was Peter, James, and John have all been with Jesus on the mountain and seen him transfigured before them. That was in verse 2. They have heard God say, This is my Son, whom I love. Verse 7. As these disciples descend the mountain with Christ, they find the other nine are in a dilemma. A large crowd surrounds a demon-possessed boy and his father, and the nine are unable, upon the father's request, to drive out the spirit. And verse 18. Christ had given them the authority to cast out demons, Mark 6, 7, verse 7, or 7 to 13. These were men who had walked and talked with Christ on a daily basis, but something was amiss. Clearly dismayed, Jesus says, O oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. Verse 19. This is, as one commentator put it, a cry wrung from the heart of Jesus. He staked his life on the redemption of the world, only to find that his nearest followers, his chosen men, beaten, baffled, helpless, and ineffective. After Jesus delivers the boy from the demon, the disciples ask him why they couldn't do it. Note Jesus' answer. He says that they could only do it by prayer, which is verse 29. Christ's words tell us a great deal. Faith must be maintained by prayer if it is to overcome the enemy. One cannot become careless in his or her walk with God, and the disciples simply could not do the work of the Lord unless they were constantly dependent upon him. In effect, Christ was saying to them, you don't live close enough to God. They had been given power, but they needed prayer to maintain that power. Unless we stay close to God, we lose our vitality and the humility of dependence. You feel like it.
with the melody
Father, we thank you, God, that because of Jesus, we are no longer slaves to fear. God, the enemy would seek to instill fear in us, to instill worry, Lord, and doubt, all of those things, God, but you came that we could be free from the devices of the enemy, Lord, and because we are children of yours, God, we need not fear. We're no longer slaves to that, to that life, Lord, or to those thoughts and to those vices of the enemy, but God, you have freed us and broken those chains off of us, and we thank you, God. Thank you, God, for bringing us into your family and making us beloved children, God, that we need not fear. We need not fear the future. We need not fear today. God, we need not fear for our families and, Lord, for ourselves. But, God, we are children of yours, and we place ourselves in your hands. And, God, we say thank you. Thank you for your loving care over us. He's promised his presence wherever two or three are gathered in his name, and I enjoy it so much. I hope you do. I hope you sense it and are thankful for it as well. Praise the Lord. Well, I hope you've got your notes with you and the pen handy as we uh, continue with the second part of a message that we began last week. And we're asking the question, what do you do when your world falls apart? You know, when you get that call that you or your loved one has cancer. Or when the boss calls you into the office and says, I'm sorry, we're starting to cut back and you're fired or you're laid off. What do you do? What do you do when a loved one walks out the door? What do you do when they break off an engagement that you had your hopes pinned on? Or when someone dies in your family that was really the pillar of your life, maybe the whole family's? What do you do when an accident happens and all of a sudden, all of your plans are thrown out the door because life changes for the foreseeable future? As we mentioned last week, there's, that's the question that a guy named Jeremiah was asking thousands of years ago. Jeremiah was a prophet in the nation of Israel. And uh, during his lifetime, he saw his nation totally decimated. And this actually happened. It was in about 586 B.C. B.C., of course, is before Christ. And so an enemy nation, it was Babylon, came in and defeated the Israelites and even took many of them out of their country back to Babylon. Now, God had a reason for this, and he tells us about it in Scripture. The Israelites had failed to give their land a Sabbath every seven years, like God had instructed them to do. And this had happened for 490 years, 70 times 7. And so, in fact, the Babylonians came, invaded, beat them in a war, and then left some in Jerusalem or in Israel, but they put their own rulers over them and they were slaves in their own country. Others were taken back to Babylon, where they were made slaves and served the Babylonian people. And this endured for 70 years. And so that 70 years was in the place of the 70 years that they did not take and give the land a Sabbath. And so when God tells us to do something, he means it, and uh, everything he tells us to do is good for us as well as good for the land. And so this is the situation, that's the context in which Jeremiah writes what we're going to look at today. The advice that he has had for his nation in the midst of that, and it rings true for us today. When your world falls apart, it doesn't matter what it is, the bottom can fall out from underneath us in so many different ways. And so, as you can imagine, at that time, there were many losses that they experienced. They would have been very angry, I'm sure, and they would have grieved many things when so much was taken from their lives. They lost their homes and everything familiar. Uh, some people were killed. Others had to journey a long distance on foot, of course, and start life again in a brand new country. But this time as slaves, not as free people like they had been before the invasion. And so there were many, many losses and unwanted changes forced upon them. Well, during that time, Jeremiah wrote two books. <coughs> One is called the Book of Jeremiah. 
And the other is called the Book of Lamentations. What is a lamentation? We talked about this last week, but just to review. It's an old English word that means an expression of grief or sorrow. And so in this message, which we began last week with part one, we're looking at six steps to take when your world falls apart. And as we mentioned last week, uh, you've probably experienced your world falling apart to some extent. Maybe you haven't had huge crises. Maybe you have. But inevitably in all of our worlds, something unravels at some point and often many times. But let's review the first three that we looked at last week. So first of all, we unload all our frustrations on God. Don't deny how you feel about life events. God created you with emotion. You ever realize that? Some people, and I, I don't know why, maybe it's the way we're raised, uh, just aren't free to express how they're feeling. God designed you with emotion. There's purpose to them. And so get comfortable with them, express them, and especially to God. For example, do you remember Hannah, uh, Elkanah's wife? And he also had a second wife, Penina. In 1 Samuel, we read about her. But on one occasion, she was weeping when her husband Elkanah saw her. And he said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? And what happened was, Hannah was childless. And uh, the other wife, Penina, rubbed it in. She just kept mocking her and, and despising her and saying, Heh, I can have children. What's wrong with you? You know, it was that jealousy that was going on in that home. And so Hannah's grieving the fact that she's childless and her husband tries to comfort her. And says, why aren't you eating? And uh, if you've gone through a season of grief, you know, you do tend to lose your appetite. And perhaps your sleeping habits are thrown off and and things get thrown out of order. Well, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 9 goes on to say, After supper, Hannah got up and went to the church to pray. She didn't keep all her strong feelings in. And then verse 10 says, And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Express yourself to the Lord. God wants to hear what's going on in you. He wants you to be honest with what's going on in you. Don't keep that stuff in. And so that was the first point. Unload all your frustration onto God. He can handle it. Secondly, after, you, after you've done that, turn your focus from the pain or whatever has caused the loss and the grief Turn it from that onto God's unfailing love. And we went into depth about this last week. Nothing will ever get resolved for you from the fr frustrations and losses of life unless you take your focus off the pain and whatever caused it. Instead of doing that, instead of keeping your focus there, like Jeremiah, we need to put it on God's unfailing love. As it says in Lamentations 3, verses 22 and 23, Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. You know, when something really critical, a crisis comes into your life, for a while, you don't know if you're going to make it through. That's what he's saying. We are not consumed. We don't know if we're going to go under. But through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And so Jeremiah got his eyes off the present situation and circumstances and onto God and who he knew God to be. And so that's the second point. Turn your focus from your pain to God's love. It's an intentional action, something we need to deliberately do. And then third, after we've done that, take some time, 
get alone with God and simply wait. Wait quietly, not to read the Bible, not to pray. You can do that later. But simply sit quietly in God's presence, and we suggest about 10 minutes, and wait. What are we waiting for? Jeremiah says, we wait for our hope to return. Verses 24 and 5, it says, The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Notice it says my soul, <laughs> not just my brain. The soul includes the real you, your personality, who you are as a person. You know, your mind is involved, but your heart is too. The Lord is my portion. Therefore, I have hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, it says, to the soul who seeks him. And so, take some time, get alone with God, and wait for hope to resurface within you. All right. So those are the first three things that we covered last week. Let's move on then to the last three for today. The next thing God tells you to do once you've done those three, and uh, you've basically said while you're waiting for God, you're saying, I'm ready to listen, Lord. Speak to me. I'm ready to hear from you now. Number four, change the things that you can change. That's the fourth thing Jeremiah tells us to do. Change the things that you can change. I want to make this clear. You know, there's a lot of things in life that we can't change. And you'll never be able to change them. You're never going to be able to change your past, for example. That's done. That's in the history books. Can't be changed. You're never going to be able to change who your parents are. You're never going to be able to change the natural gifts you were given by God or the ones you don't have. You know, so there's no point being jealous about somebody else's. There's a lot of things in your life we simply can't change. If you have a certain handicap or if you lose, to lo lose a loved one along life's way, we can't change things like that. And so a lot of things in life we can't change. The only way to overcome some things in life is to simply accept them. This is the principle of submission. This is the principle of surrender. This is the principle of acceptance. Peace comes when I accept the things in my life that cannot be changed. You hear that? Peace comes, your inner peace comes when you accept the things in life that you cannot change. If I keep fighting about those things the rest of my life and say, oh God, this isn't fair. How come you didn't make me musical? You know, how come I don't have this gift or that gift or this ability or how come all of those negative things happen to me? We could focus on that stuff our entire life. And sadly, some people do. But there's absolutely no point to it because it's not going to change anything. We need to accept the things that cannot be changed. Faith is facing the facts without being discouraged by them. Faith is facing the facts without being discouraged by them. You say, yeah, it's bad, but I'm not going to be defeated by this situation. But while I accept the things that can't be changed, I do change the things that can be changed. And so, let's focus on that, and I'll tell you what you can change. What you can change is you. You cannot change anybody else, so you might as well quit trying to change your husband, change your wife, change your boss, change your friend. No point trying to change somebody else. But the only person 
we can change is ourself. And so the focus becomes, you start working on you and you ask the question, what can I change in me? Because the truth is, there's always room for change in ourselves. And so how can I be better, not bitter, when my world is falling apart? Wow, that sounds like such a radical thing to do, doesn't it? But that's what Christianity is about. See, it's because our lives are based on who God is, not just based on fate and circumstances of life happening. No, we've always got hope because of God's faithful love. And so it's important to do something to become better, not bitter. Now, this is going to require some honest gut-level self-evaluation. And let's be honest, folks. It's easier to keep blaming others for your unhappiness or your stress. Do I get an amen from that? <laughs> you guys have lived long enough. You know it's easier to blame others than to take responsibility and do something productive in your own life, right? But to move out from under those feelings of life is just unfair, it's going to require a new focus on something you can change. And that something is you. And so you're going to need to do an inventory of your life. You're going to need to do a relational inventory. So ask questions like, how's my relationship to God? And be honest about it, folks. I mean, God knows. You might as well fess up as well. How's my relationship to my husband, to my wife, to my kids, to my co-workers at work? And so a good place to start is do a relational inventory. I'm sure you'll find some room to change something there. Next, do a moral inventory. What are the habits and the hurts and the hang-ups that are still messing up my life? What are the sins, those persistent things that keep bringing me down? You do a moral inventory by asking questions like that. And so you do an honest evaluation of your life so you can find things to work on and change the things that can be changed. And so we look for what's wrong in my life that I can improve and make it better. Look at verse 40 in Lamentations chapter 3 and Jeremiah says, he says, let us examine our ways. What is that? What does that mean? Well, that's let's do a personal inventory. Let us examine our ways. Simple phrase, but maybe you've never thought of it that way before. That's what he's saying. Let us examine our ways and test them. And then let us return to the Lord. Interesting phrases. What he's really saying is, let us look at what needs changing. It's not quite right. Let's be honest about it. Let's put it to the test. And then let's do something. And so he's saying, repent, return, change my mind on something. Let me examine my ways and repent. And this is what the Bible says we need to do when our world is falling apart. An interesting verse in Corinthians, I believe it is. Uh, it's always intrigued me, especially once I became a counselor, because uh, I'm helping people deal with loss in life quite often in my counseling, because there's always so many losses. And, and this verse intrigued me, and I, I've never heard a good sermon on it that really satisfied my heart and head. But it says, Godly sorrow leads to repentance in Corinthians. I think it's maybe 9 6. Uh, godly sorrow leads to repentance. When do we sorrow? 
We sorrow when we experience loss. Well, when we experience loss, aren't we just a victim and kind of helpless in this, these waves of grief that roll over us? Well, some people act like that, but that's not what God is saying. He says godly sorrow will lead you to repent of something. What's it going to make me repent of? I've thought long and hard about this, and I've come to the conclusion it's going to make me repent, or it can lead me to repent, of my wrong dependencies. See, we tend to depend on the things that we can see and the people that we have around us. And so if we lose someone close to us, that can knock the feet out from underneath you. Why? Because you were depending too much on them. We know intellectually our dependence is supposed to be on God first and foremost, and the greatest amount of our dependence is supposed to be on God. If I asked you about that, you could have all told me that. You know that. But in practice, which one of us is doing it? Let's just be real and honest here. And that's what that verse means. Godly sorrow will lead to repentance. When something gets knocked out from underneath you, it'll help you see, Ugh, I was depending on my bank account too much. God says I need to depend on him. No wonder I was running in circles, stressed out, anxious about trying to settle my fears down by making more money. My dependence on my bank account was too huge. I just need to trust in God more. My bank account, less. I need to trust in my spouse, less. And God, more. I need to trust in fame or position or reputation, a little bit less. On friendships, a little bit less. And on God, more. That's what that verse means. And so let us examine our ways, test them, and return to the Lord. See, when you start doing this, this step four, change what you can change, and you look at your life, you're going to realize there's a lot of unresolved emotions inside of you. Don't get scared by that. I'm just telling you, that's normal. Because when your world falls apart, things don't go as you planned, and you're a bundle of emotions from the present situation, it pulls up a lot of emotion at that time. But guess what? There's also going to be a lot of unresolved emotions from the past that surface again. Because in all of us, we seldom totally work through big issues in our life. We might work through them a little bit, and then we shelve them. We push them down. We suppress the emotion and push away negative memories of things. And so you're going to feel grief. You're going to feel anger. You're going to feel frustrated. You may feel regret or maybe a little bit of guilt. You may second guess yourself at times like that. This is normal. This is common. And so if you're going through that, don't panic. You may say, what if this, sir? What if that? If only I had done this instead of that. And you're going to have all these emotions and questions that you need to face. And you're going to have to deal with that stuff. But that's good that it's come up because then you can deal with it. And so it gives you the opportunity to deal with those real issues, to work them through to realize what needs changing in your life. Where do you need to practice more dependence on God for something in your life? Only then will you find yourself truly moving forward and feel like you're growing towards uh, a stronger faith in Jesus Christ. Now, as everything's coming up and there's going to be a, a mixture of feelings, there's one emotion that I'm really concerned about as your pastor that you get out of your life because it's the most damaging emotion you can have. You need to deal with all of them, 
But there's one emotion that's going to keep you from rebuilding your life after your life has fallen apart. Do you know what that most damaging emotion would be? It's fear. It's fear. See, fear can paralyze you. Grief doesn't usually paralyze you. It might get you stuck temporarily. But fear, if we don't get it out of our lives, can paralyze us forever. You remember many, many years ago, the old newspaper columnist Ann Landers, I think you're all old enough to remember her. Uh, Ann Landers in her heyday would give advice to people in the newspaper. and She would receive apparently up to 10,000 letters a day. People would ask her all kinds of questions, many of them quite foolish. But anyways, somebody asked her one time, what's the most common problem people ask you about? And she said, without a doubt, it's fear. It's the fear of the future. It's the fear of going broke. It's the fear of failure. It's the fear of death. It's the fear of being alone. There's so many things to be afraid of. And all of the different fears that people have, they would write her about. Well, in our text, Jeremiah had a real reason to be fearful. Because not only was his nation falling apart economically, socially, militarily, and all those things affected him, but it was falling apart in front of his eyes, and he was a prophet to his nation. And so as he spoke, he was telling the people the truth about why the nation was in trouble. See, God spoke through the prophets. And so he would tell the people why the nation was in decline. It's because you haven't respected the Lord's command to practice giving the land a Sabbath for 490. He was telling them the truth, the reason for the problem. And so Jeremiah was very, very unpopular with his own people. And he had a lot of reasons to be fearful of them because in those days, they didn't have blogs, so they couldn't just write on the internet, you know, on Facebook or Snapchat or whatever people used. They couldn't just go there and say, ah, that Jeremiah, he's just a big skunk. <laughs> yeah. They didn't have social media. In those days, there was no place to throw verbal grenades at a person. So do you know what they did back then? They would put you down in the bottom of a well and leave you there for a few days. To maybe think about what you're doing when they didn't like you. And so often that well was a cistern, which meant it was just a dugout hole filled with water. And that water would grow to be so putrid. And that's actually what happened to Jeremiah. See, he kept saying, let me tell you what's wrong with our nation. Let me tell you how to correct the problem. And nobody liked what he was saying. Nobody wanted to take personal ownership. And so his enemies took Jeremiah and they threw him into a well. And so he's in the bottom of the well and the water's coming up and flowing over his head. And it says that they threw a bunch of rocks down on top of him. Well, that would be pretty frightening if you're him. And he didn't know how long he was going to be in there. And he didn't know if he was even going to survive. And so he could have had a lot of fear in that situation. The Bible tells us this story. He's literally in a pit. Now you talk about being in a hole in your life. Well, he's literally in a hole. And in verse 53, it says this. It says, my enemies threw me into a pit and dropped stones on me. The water flowed over my head, and I cried out, This is the end. But I called on your name, Lord, from deep within the well, and you heard me, and you listened to my pleading. You heard my weeping. Now this is coming from a grown man. Sometimes we think crying and weeping and yelling that's just for kids or silly teenagers. No. We, we need to be real. And we need to cry out to God. 
like Jeremiah did. He said, you came at my despairing cry and you told me, do not fear. Obviously, that's what he needed to hear. Now, I, I'm pretty sure I've mentioned this to you before that there's actually <clears throat> 365 fear nots in the Bible, one for every day of the year. And so it's a theme God wants us to get. He wants us to understand it and to uh, take action on that. Because the one thing God does not want you to do is to be afraid. See, you can be angry at God. You can be upset. You can gripe to him about all kinds of stuff. You can complain. You can question. But God says, don't you dare be afraid and live in fear. Now, just like anxiety, you know, we read uh, Philippians 4 and the first line of verse 4 says, be anxious for nothing. And then it goes on to give us uh, an equation how to get rid of anxiety. Don't be fooled by the first line when it says don't be anxious about something to think you're never going to have anxiety. Otherwise, he wouldn't have given you instructions following that how to deal with it. And the same thing about fear. Of course, you're going to be afraid. Okay, but don't keep it. Don't live in fear. Learn how to deal with it and learn that it's so important that God gives us fear nuts for every day of the year. And so you can do all this other stuff to God. You can question, you can complain, you can gripe. You can say, God, this stinks. That's unfair. Life is bad. And you can go on and on and on and rant with God. He can handle that. But he says, don't you dare be afraid. And that's what he was saying to Jeremiah here. Don't, don't, don't be afraid. Don't make your decisions out of fear. Don't keep today's fear for tomorrow. Don't do it, is what he's saying. Okay, that was number four. Change the things that you can change. Examine your ways and repent. You know, one of the best ways to stop complaining is to take your thoughts off the pain and those causing it and focus first on God and his unfailing love for you and then on a way that you can change yourself for the better. See, fear always comes and stays when we remain concerned about something that someone else is in control of. So you can't change it. You know, maybe it's something the government is doing and you can get all in a t tizzy about it. Oh, 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 and you go and chat to this person, you go and chat to that person, you go and chat to this person. What are you doing? Well, you're just accepting the fear and inviting it to stay because your mind is focused on something you don't like, but you have no power to change it. And so all you're doing is fear, stay with me, fear, stay with me. And you just stay focused on what you're afraid of. And so let's not do that. Focus on something that we can change. And so remember what God said to Jeremiah in his horrible situation. He also says the same to you and to me. Do not fear. And so how do we do that? Well, we need to keep our eyes and trust on God like he did. While we work to change those things, we can actually change the things inside ourselves. Okay, that's number four. Let's move on to number five. The fifth thing we need to do is this. I ask God to relieve my fears. Maybe you've tried to get rid of them and had some trouble. Well, do what Jeremiah did. He says, I called on your name, Lord. And when I did, you listened to my pleading. You heard my weeping. And you came to my need. You came at my despairing cry. And you told me, you reminded me, you instructed me, you beckoned me. Do not fear. Don't fear, Jeremiah. Don't fear. 
And so when we're totally honest and we unload our concerns and feelings on God, we can expect Him to remind us of the same thing. In one of those quiet moments when we're with Him, He's probably going to say, Don't fear. Don't fear, Billy. Don't fear, Susan. Don't fear, Mary. He's going to say that to you during those quiet moments. And so, if we sense fear trying to creep in, because it will. Remember what I just said a minute ago? Just because he says don't fear, doesn't mean fear is not going to come and try to creep in. It will. And so if you sense it trying to creep in, we can go and ask God to help relieve our fears. Now, often that might be a bit of a process, might take some time, rather than an instant light switch type of moment. You know, sometimes we think when we go to God, because God is so awesome, everything's going to be instantaneous. You know, if God's really hearing, if he's really listening, he's going to just do the miracle and bingo, everything's going to change in an instant, you know, like a wizard hitting his wand. And Well, God is not a wizard. God's a real life God. And he chooses to walk through things with us. And sometimes it happens in an instant. And sometimes it takes a little bit of time. That's the reality of it. And one of the reasons it takes time can be that our fears are directly connected to our beliefs. See, fear is often connected to our beliefs about our personal shortcomings, about our limitations. You know, they say one of the things people fear most is public speaking. And so think about it. If, if you were to come up here this morning, in fact, I asked Cheryl when she came to church this morning, I said, do you want to switch roles this morning? I'll run your computer and you go give the message. <laughs> she just chuckled. <laughs> if I was to ask you the same thing, you probably would too. Why? Because you think about standing up here and what's going to happen. Uh, I don't know if I could do that. Well, why? You know, we, we know our own shortcomings. We know our own limitations. We know our own insecurities. And fear is often connected to those things or to the things we believe we have to have in order to be safe or happy or fulfilled. Fear is often connected to those things or beliefs about those things. And I want to encourage you this morning, give God some time to work in you on those kinds of things. And don't try to rush the process. If fear is trying to creep in, try to understand what it's connected to. And especially, what's the belief behind that? Overcome the fear rather than just deflecting it, avoiding it, and never growing. And another reason why I say that is because a lot of our beliefs are actually based in lies. We think to ourselves, oh, I could never do that. One of our favorite TV shows is uh, The Amazing Race. And they have a kind of a U.S. version where they go around the world. And they have a Canadian version. And the Canadian version just finished. The other one is just starting. But they have all kinds of challenges, uh, like bungee jumping and... Uh, all kinds of things that are quite challenging. And people can just freak out sometimes and say, oh, I can never do that. But they have to do it if they want to continue in the competition. You know, we can face moments like that too, and we can say, oh, I can never do that. And guess what? Every time they try it on the race, we've watched this for years. I don't think any of them couldn't do it once they actually tried why did they say that initially? I can't do this. Because it's based on a lie. And see, Satan's the father of lies. And he'll try to convince you, you can't handle grief. You can't handle conflict. You can't work out problems with your kids. You can't get that promotion at work. You can't become the writer, the painter, the whatever it is. Satan's going to feed you all kinds of lies. And you've got to sort out what are really true and what are really lies because your fear will often be based in those lies. 
And so do what David did in Psalm 34, 4, we read, I prayed to the Lord and he answered me, freeing me from all my fears. You know, we so often put David up on this pedestal, don't we? We think, oh, he's, uh, Scripture says he had a heart like God's. And uh, we think, did that make him perfect? Listen to what he says. He said he had fears just like the rest of us do. But he says, I prayed to the Lord and he freed me from my fears. There's a process going on there. And so we can be like David. Maybe you're more familiar with this version of the same verse. It says, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. That's that same verse. See, God wants us to be fear-free. In Psalm 27, 13, we read this. And in that context, David was going through a tough time. His world was actually falling apart. And, and uh, he said, I would have despaired. I would have gone under. I would have given up. I would have been ready to throw in the towel. And, and these were his actual words. It says, I would have despaired when my world fell apart unless I had believed. Do you see the trust there? Unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. He says, I believe that God wasn't through with me yet. And so I wasn't going to be afraid. I wasn't going to give up. I trusted in God. And that's a decision we make when fear tries to keep in. We have to decide. You know, Timothy says, fear is not of God. We have to decide, do we believe that? And are we going to act in, in line with that belief? So, you know, if God says we shouldn't be afraid, there must be reasons and truths to support why that's a good thing for us, not to be afraid. But even if you don't see what those reasons are, remember that Isaiah says, God's ways and thoughts are so far superior to ours. In fact, it says the weakest of God's thoughts, if there is such a thing, is still so far above the best thought any person could ever have. Like there's no comparison. And so if God says something, we need to trust it. We need to remind ourselves that God is still God and he always will be God. He's not about to change. And he's ultimately in control of all things. The other thing that's good to remember is that God is a God who still performs miracles. And perhaps he will perform one in your situation when your world falls apart. And so like David, let's not despair, but let's believe that we will once again see the goodness of God demonstrated either directly in our situation or at least in those around us when things are going bad. So don't be afraid. Trust that God is not done with you yet, and therefore you can expect to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living as well. The truth is, God is always active with his love and with his purposes, even though we might not see it with our natural eyes. And so if you think that your life is beyond repair, you're wrong. If you think it can't be restored, you're wrong. If you think that your best days are all behind you, you're wrong. If you think it's impossible for God to bring good out of bad, you're wrong about all of those. Jesus Christ is in the business of restoration, reconditioning, refurbishing, renewing, and recovering that which is lost. In fact, Jesus said, I came to seek and to save that which is lost. Not only you, but also what you have lost. The Bible says in Corinthians, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The old is passed away, the new is come. Jesus' focus, God's focus, is 
to make things new. And again, we read that in Revelation chapter uh, 21, verse 5. Jesus said there, Behold, I make all things new. <clears throat> I, had a, I heard a sermon on that a few months ago, and uh, it really challenged me to dwell and meditate on that phrase. Jesus said in Revelation 21, at the end of the Bible, I make all things, all. Have you ever heard what the definition of all is? All. <laughs> Jesus said, I make all things. That's his desire. That's his purpose. That's his agenda. And so if you've got something that needs to be restored and made new, you're in line with what he wants to do. And so God wants you to move ahead into maturity, into the fullness of his purpose for you. And since you can't do that, if you're stuck in fear, he wants to keep you free from fear. And so don't be afraid to ask God to help relieve your fears. He definitely will, because you know that's his will for you. Okay, that was number five. So the last thing you need to do then to rebuild your broken life after your world falls apart is this. Number six, I must expect Jesus to restore my life. See, there's a variety of ways, perhaps hundreds, of how the bottom can fall out of a person's life. A lot of things can happen to us in life. And whatever it is that brings crisis into one's life, there's bound to be fears, doubts, maybe some failed attempts of handling it in your own way, you know, in the flesh before you seek God. Uh, it's probably going to be a lot of hurt and pain, perhaps frustration and heartache, uh, whether it's a broken relationship, a lost career, an accident that totally changes you or a loved one, a death, a sickness, whatever it might be. There's so many different things that can cause a crisis in our life. So when your world falls apart, there's always going to be loss, always things you don't like, always a degree of brokenness in your world, and generally a sense of discouragement and maybe even a sense of hopelessness. And so there's always a need for restoration. Jesus is in the restoration business. When someone with a sincere heart and a little bit of faith comes to him for help, he will help. Just think about the numerous examples we have in the Bible. You know, we can think about Job, one of the first men mentioned in the Bible. He was known as the greatest of all the people in the East. He was very wealthy and righteous, and yet he lost all of his animals, and he had thousands of them, as well as his seven sons and three daughters. He lost them all in one day. All were killed. His world fell apart that day. We can think about Joseph, who was the second youngest of the 12 sons of Jacob, the famous, whose name was later changed to Israel. And Joseph was sold by his brothers into slavery because of jealousy. Can you imagine your own family selling you into slavery? And then he gets there and he's un unfairly accused, accused of raping his master's wife. And so he's then thrown into prison where he spent about the next 12, 14, 15 years of his life. His world fell apart. What about Jonah, who ran from God, hoping to escape what he considered a difficult and humiliating task from God? As he traveled the opposite direction to get away from God, and a storm arose on the sea, it was decided that the storm was because of Jonah and his sin. And so he was cast overboard into the ocean. Is that the moment Jonah's life fell apart? Or was it a few moments later when this great fish swallowed him and he spent the next three days and three nights in the fish's belly? 
I'm sure it seemed like his world fell apart. You know, we've already mentioned Hannah, who was childless but desperately wanted a child. We could also mention Rachel and Elizabeth in the same breath, who were also childless for many years. We could remember the woman with an issue of blood who couldn't find relief, no matter how hard she tried, for 12 years. We can look at the man who laid lame beside the pool of Bethesda for 38 years. The leper who went searching for Jesus in the wilderness. Or in Matthew chapter 9, we could consider the paralytic who can't even go to Jesus. And finally, four friends took him there. Or the grieving father whose daughter had just died. Or the two blind men who cried out to Jesus, likely been blind all their lives. Or the man who couldn't speak and was demon-possessed. On and on the examples are there to see. At what point for each of these did the bottom fall out of their lives, I wonder? And for some of them, it was probably more than once. See, when the bottom falls out, or something catches us off guard, or we feel out of control of what's happening around us, we need to pray what Jeremiah prayed. In verse 21 of Lamentations chapter 5, we read this. He says, Restore us, O Lord, and bring us back to you again. And so now this is chapter 5. In chapter 3, he said, call out to the Lord. Now he's saying, restore us and bring us back to you. Do you see how the solution is always some form of coming back to God? <laughs> so often we just try to make life work and leave God out of the equation, don't we? He says, restore us, O Lord, and bring us back to you again. Then, then, look, what he, then look what it says. Give us back the joys we once had. Have you been there? Have you been at that spot where you're just joyless and hope can't be found no matter how many closets you clean out of the inside of your life? Yeah, that's where he was at. You know, if you try to handle it all on your own, it might be very hard to get past the fears get them out of your life, or difficult to shake the doubt that wants to settle in, make itself home, or to lay aside the anxiety and to trust that life will be good again. But when you let Jesus bring you back, he will also give you what you need. Not necessarily what you want, but he will give you what you need. He is a very giving and generous God. As we've read before in Lamentations 3, verses 22 and 23, not only is God faithful, but his mercies and compassion are new every morning. Every morning. 2 Timothy 2.13 reminds us even if we're faithless, and we often are, we all mess up, He, God, remains faithful. He cannot deny Himself. In other words, it's His character. He can't be anything different than faithful. And James 1.17 reminds us, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation, no shadow of turning. In other words, with God, there's no lies, there's no fakeness, there's no shadow of things. Everything is clear and true and honest and pure. And so at times when the bottom falls, falls out of your world, you might hesitate to go to God. But you know what? Every one of the people in the examples I mentioned a minute ago, they all went to God. And he met each one of them where they were at. In so many different situations. Job, Job had his losses restored 
twofold. Joseph was not only released from prison, but he was vindicated of the charge of raping the master's wife and then elevated by the master into the top position in the nation. This is the working of God. Jonah's life was spared and he was allowed the opportunity to go back and fulfill the initial calling God had given him, which was to give a spiritual warning to the people of Nineveh. And guess what happened? That then led to the entire city of Nineveh repenting and coming to God. And so Jonah's life was restored. Hannah, Rachel, Elizabeth were all given children and each child they bore rose to prominence. The woman with the issue of blood was healed. The lame man walked. The leper was made whole. The father's daughter was raised back to life. The two blind men were given sight and the mute man could speak and was delivered from demon possession. Do I hear an amen? <laughs> God is a giving and generous God. He not only does a work in our life, but he works with the, the situations of our life. And so these and other examples in the Bible are for our encouragement and for our instruction to do the same, to call out to God as they did. John 20, verse 30 and 31 says, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life. Jesus said, I came to bring abundant life. And so like Jeremiah, we too can cry out to God, Restore us, O Lord, and bring us back to you again. Give us back the joys we once had. Well, I encourage you this morning, try not to wait until you hit rock bottom. In every situation, take it to Jesus. Even when you can't fathom how he will see you through to another day or solve the problem before you, always take it to Jesus. He specializes in restoration, in reconditioning, in refurbishing, in renewing, and recovering that which is lost. Remember, Jesus said, I came to seek and save that which is lost. <clears throat> when you go to Jesus, go with expectancy, with faith. He wants to restore you and those things that are needful in your life. That's what we learn through the, these examples. Well, that concludes the six steps we need to take when something happens that makes our world fall apart. Let's put them all together in a quick review. So first, be honest with God. Tell Him how you feel. Tell Him how the situation's affecting you. Unload your frustration to God. Secondly, after doing that, it's a bit of a catharsis. You'll probably be ready. Okay, change your focus. Get it off the pain. Don't camp there too long. Get it off the pain and realize God's love is so unfailing. And Romans tells us nothing can separate us from his love. And then thirdly, don't be in a rush. Get alone with God and, and just wait. Wait for some hope, some new life, some new purpose to appear. But it's going to appear from the inside. Sit and wait for that. Don't be looking out here. Sit with God and let it arise on the inside. That's how God works. And then fourth, change the things you can change. Realize what things can't be changed that you have to accept. And then find something in your life that can take you to the next level. Number five, ask God to relieve my fears. Yeah, fear's going to try to come in and Satan's going to try to lie to you. Just be aware of that. God will help 
relieve the fears because you know he doesn't want you to be afraid. And then sixth, keep your expectancy alive. Relight faith in your life. If life has poured some cold water on it and tried to make all the sparks go out. Relight faith. Have some expectancy when you go to God in prayer, when you cry out to him. He wants to restore, and he will. Well, let's pray. In verse 24 of our text in Lamentations 3, it says, Deep in my heart I say, The Lord is all I need. I can depend on him. Can you say that this morning? Will you pray this prayer? I encourage you to make this prayer I'm going to pray. Make it your own as I pray. Dear God, you know all the frustrations in our hearts. You know all the things that I thought were unfair and the things that I have rebelled against and resisted. This morning I give you all those frustrations. Forgive my sins and my disobedience. I want to turn my focus from off my pain to your unfailing love. You have said, hope returns when I remember this one thing, that the Lord's unfailing love and mercy still continue and are new every morning. So thank you that your love for me is sure and strong. Lord, I want to do what Jeremiah did. When life is heavy and hard to take, I want to go off by myself, enter the silence, bow in prayer, not asking questions, but wait for hope to appear. I will wait for hope to appear. And today, Lord, I commit to spending 10 minutes in silence with you every day. I'm going to try to do that. Help me to change the things that I can change, to stop working on trying to change other people and just start working on changing me. Help me to be ruthlessly honest, to examine my ways and to test them and return in obedience to you, Lord. And then most of all, God, I ask you, when fears try to creep in, please help me to keep them out. When I feel I'm thrown into a pit and it seems like the water is rising, the stones are coming, and there's nothing I can do about it, and it seems like the end. Oh God, I want to call on your name from deep within that well. I want to thank you that you listen to my pleading. You hear my weeping and anguish. And you come at my despairing cry. And you assure me there is no need to fear. And even though, though that goes against all the circumstances I see with my natural eyes, Help me to believe that at the deepest part of who I am. And Jesus, I pray as Jeremiah prayed, restore me, O Lord. Bring me back to you again and give me back the joy I once had. The joy of my salvation, daily saving me from myself and my pride and from the other enemies in this invisible war each one of us is in. Now, if you're listening this morning and you've never invited Jesus into your life, I want you to know that Jesus specializes in new beginnings and fresh starts. It's called being born again. Being born into God's spiritual kingdom where you become his child and he becomes your heavenly father. And so simply say this, Jesus, please come into my life today. 
Please forgive me for all my sins, all the things I've ever done wrong. I want to know you. I want to get to love you. I want to follow you. And so I give you my whole life. Please help me, Jesus. Amen. And so, Heavenly Father, I don't know all that everybody's going through here today, but you do. And I know that no matter what the problem is, you are the answer. Coming back to you is the answer. And so we turn to you in Jesus' name.